This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. Jeff Harcourt is perhaps one of Australia's best-known economists. A student of John Maynard Keynes, he's perhaps best known for his Cambridge controversies in the theory of capital. A conference in his honour has recently been held on the occasion of Jeff's 80th birthday. I'm pleased to say that Jeff Harcourt is at the Australian School of Business and is with me now. So the conference was held in your honour, celebrating your 80 years, but over those 80 years you must have seen some real big fundamental changes in economic theory and, and the economics of the world. Yes, <laughs> certainly. Uh, well, because I grew up in Melbourne and, and um, was educated at Melbourne University, which was very Cambridge-orientated department. Uh, so Keynes and Piero Straffer and uh, Joan Robinson and Richard Kahn uh, Morris Dobb were all household wor words to us. Uh, and of course, um, Keynes was the great word. So when I got an overseas scholarship to go and do a PhD overseas, naturally I went to King's College, Cambridge, where Keynes was. That was obviously the mecca of any aspiring young economist in those days. So I beavered away at, um, at my uh, PhD. But in the second year I was there in 56, one of my mentors and someone who became one of my colleagues and greatest friends, Joan Robinson, brought out her magnum opus, The Accumulation of Capital. What she was trying to do there was to take Keynes's ideas and to what she called generalise them to the long period, that is to go back with the Keynesian contributions behind her and look again at the great problems of the classical political economists, growth, distribution, development, accumulation, technical progress in the light of Keynes's contributions. So soaking myself in the accumulation of capital had a, a, a lasting effect on my approach to economics and my understanding uh, of economics. And it's very much in what Joan would have called the post-Keynesian tradition. And the characteristics of post-Keynesianism is that you are an always analysing uh, economies and people behaving in the light of the fact that they have to make decisions uh, in the face of inescapable uncertainty. So the future has an influence on the present, but the future is unknown. And mainstream theory on the whole only can introduce uncertainty if it's the same thing as risk. But one of the things that Keynes told us it was that Risk is something where you can have a probability distribution. Uncertainty is something where there is no probability distribution. And so you have to develop conventions and rules of thumb to allow you to proceed. And post Keynesian economics is concerned with how that affects economic decisions and how the economy works and so on. Uh, so uh, when you got your lectureship yes. at uh, Cambridge, were you then able to develop the post-Keynesian theory that, that you're well known well, for I, now? I published quite a lot of articles while I was there and stayed from 63 to the end of 66. Uh, and then we returned to, uh, to Adelaide, where I immediately got stuck into the anti-Vietnam War movement. But then a major life-changing event occurred in my intellectual life. There was a guy called Mark Perlman. He was the first editor of the Journal of Economic Literature, which did surveys of uh, areas in economics. And he was in Australia when uh, the bloke who was supposed to write the second survey on capital theory uh, wrote and said, no, he couldn't do it. He'd offend his patrons and pulled out. So I agreed to do the second uh, survey article, and that became some Cambridge controversies in the theory of capital it became a very, very influential and controversial survey um, and subsequently became an even more controversial and influential book. So that really gave me an international reputation, both good and bad, I suspect, but I was an absolute boon to the graduate students uh, at the time because there were these arcane um, controversies between Cambridge England and Cambridge Mass and and very difficult to literature though it was about fundamental things and you know I was mine was a child's guide to it so I was I was uh, 
the pin-up boy of many a graduate student of those years. Well, well, well I'm, I'm sure many people actually do, do still read through them because they are that perfect sort of A to Z guide of the economic theory yeah. that you need to know. But at the same time, they were quite controversial at the time, particularly w w w with that uh, argument between Cambridge in the UK, Cambridge in the US, and in yeah. the US, they weren't perhaps quite as well received. That, that There was a slight suggestion that maybe they were somewhat left-wing. Oh, yes. Well, I, well, because the thing I really got into strife about was to say uh, ideology and analysis are indissolubly mixed. And I said you could predict which side of the debate people would uh, be on according to their stance on the Vietnam War, uh, at least in the early days before it was clear the Americans were going to be beaten. And, of course, uh, in the 70s, I was back in Australia, very interested in economic policy you know, with the rise of stagflation and and the chucking out of Whitlam and um, Fraser and he's ilk bringing in a crude version of monetarism here, having been helped by Bill Hayden, I might say, who was a, who was a good friend of mine, but uh, a group of my, my greatest friend and mentor at Adelaide was a bloke called Eric Russell. And uh, we were developing alternative package deal of policies to preserve full employment while tackling inflation, which Eric and another great Australian economist who died at 34 tragically, uh, Wilfred Salter, they had the Salter-Russell rule that in a full employment policy you should adjust money wages by overall productivity plus prices. Completely the opposite of what people argue now with flexible labour markets and so on. So amongst the package which became known as the Adelaide Plan included this um, uh, Russell Salter approach which grew out of their evidence to the Arbitration Commission. And when I was the economist on the 1979 ALP Committee of Inquiry as to why they'd done so badly in 75 and 77, I wrote uh, discussion, uh, the draft of discussion paper number six, uh, Economic Issues and the Future of Australia, in which I put in a package deal based on what we've been working on and which Ralph Willis had been a lone voice in the ALP, a voice crying in the wilderness for similar points of view. So we were the academics who provided the academic arguments and he was the politician who tried to get us through. And I also want to point out that uh, while I've told you about theory, of course I did a I, I always thought policy was the, the end product of why you did economics as did Keynes. But um, as a result of my involvement in the anti-war protests, I had been influenced by Hugh Stretton, who I regard as the greatest progressive thinker in, uh, in Australia, and Noam Chomsky's essay, The Responsibility of Intellectuals, where he in, in effect says, if you make the palm, you can't say, I wash my hands of what's done with it. You have a social responsibility to say how it's been used. And Hugh's book published in 69 called The Political Sciences, in which he argued that in the social sciences and history and law, um, you cannot separate ideology and analysis, they're indissolubly mixed. And if you pretend, or if you argue otherwise, you're corrupting your students. Uh, so from then on, I always told students what my political, religious and philosophical values were and what my approach to economics was. And I said, well, no, I don't expect you necessarily to agree with me, and I'd much rather read a first-class attack on me than a third-rate agreement. Who wants a third-rater on their side? But you know, this is where I come from. Um, and I think that economics is absolutely steeped in what's gone before, and you cannot understand people's contributions unless you understand them. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.